This is an absolutely great day, and please will you kindly welcome um, Felicity Allgate to the stage. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's really amazing seeing so many people here. I do feel I've been slightly undermined, as Francesca talked about this morning, you actually all make relative decisions, so compared to her amazing performance, I've got quite a lot to live up to. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, I think, quite a nice overlap with what Francesca, uh, Francesca talked about this morning. So she talked about behavioural insights, but from a kind of how you apply it to yourself as an individual. So how you make sure that you aren't derailed in the decisions you make. What I'm going to talk about um, is how you apply it to your job, um, with a particular focus on kind of applying it in a public policy section, uh, um, situation. So here, um, I've called it from theory to application. Uh, don't worry, it's not super theoretical. What I'm going to run through is uh, a framework that we have developed in, or was written um, a few years ago by the as part of the behavioural insights um, development in a public policy context. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, if so, kind of hopefully you'll hear something new. Um, and if you haven't heard of it, then hopefully this will give you kind of quite a nice introduction to a bit more of a systematic overview. Now, I'm going to start off with a bit of an exercise to wake you up. Uh, last session of the day, over halfway through the week, is always quite a tough gig because it sounds like you've had quite a hard time already. Lots of working, lots of people I've heard saying, oh, gosh, my brain hurts, lots to think about. So, oh, all right, try again. So what I'm going to do is I would like you all to take a pen and a piece of paper, and I'm going to put up a list of words. And I don't want you to write anything at the moment, so no writing, sorry, I should have said, you know. Um, and I want you to, we'll go through this list of words and then you'll get your pen and you, I will give you two minutes to write down as many of those words as you can remember. So, first one, we've got bed, rest. So please don't write these down, this is just you remembering at the moment. Awake, tired, dream, Wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, drowsy. So now, I'll give you a couple of minutes to write down all the words that you can remember. Right, how are you going? Do you want a few more minutes or do you think you've sort of reached? <laughs> Had enough. Okay. <laughs> and you'll see there was, there was a definite theme to the words I chose. So, I want you to now, I'm going to read out um, a list of words and can you please raise your hand if you remember them and you've written them down. Oh, I'm obviously being a bit keen with this uh, clicker. Right, so, who remembers snore? Pretty good. Wake. Excellent. Blanket. Not bad. You've all got very good memories. Nap. Sleep. Are you sure you remember sleep? <laughs> so don't worry. Um, you're not alone. Um, about 40 to 55% of people in exercises using the same words as this, but also very similar words, misremember. And this is just a nice sort of, uh, partly to wake you up at the beginning of the session, but also to kind of give you an illustration of how actually our minds basically are very good at sort of playing tricks on us, and we can be very confident that we definitely remembered sleep, and actually we didn't. So, uh, what are behavioural insights? We use this term quite a lot and quite widely, and actually there's no clear definition of it. And that's because it's really a kind of collection of a whole vast swathe of academic research that has gone on over the past 40 or 50 years. It's sometimes known as behavioral economics as well. Um, and, uh, but basically, I'm going to try and kind of whiz through, summarize what's going on. Now, these uh, images up here, there are four book covers. If you want to kind of get a good overview of behavioral insights, read all those. Um, so the first one is called Gut Feelings. 
And this is saying that, you know, don't deny the power of snap judgments and subconscious reasoning. So I think sometimes it's sort of seen as when we talk about behavioral insights and kind of people making errors and mistakes in their decision making, it's sometimes seen as though we're saying, well, you know, people are, are acting in an incorrect way. Um, now, the guy who wrote this book, Gerd Gigerenza, he actually believes very strongly that there are very good reasons that we have developed these uh, mechanisms and ways of operating. It's actually very efficient. Um, we make very quick snap decisions. And in many cases, actually, they're pretty good. It's just that in some situations, it might lead us to make a decision which isn't as good as it could be. Um, thinking fast and slow. Uh, this was written by Daniel Kahneman. Um, he is a Nobel Prize winning economist. Um, this is a really, really excellent book if you want a kind of really good in-depth uh, introduction into behavioral insights. So he is generally seen as kind of the founder of behavioral insights. Um, his big uh, model is that the brain has two systems. We have system one and system two. System one is kind of the, uh, the analytical, sorry, system one is kind of the automatic, um, very quick kind of processing. So this is the kind of thing that when you're taking your daily commute to work, you will usually be working on kind of system one. So actually you're making quite a lot of really quite detailed judgments and adjustments, but you're probably doing it while also thinking about what you're going to do that day when you get to work, what you need to do when you get home, that the washing needs doing, all that sort of stuff. System two is much slower, more effortful, more analytic. And a good example to continue with the sort of uh, traveling analogy is um, about planning the journey you're going to take to get to where you're going on holiday. So you will spend much more time kind of thinking about that and how you're going to get there. Um, and generally, policy is designed to kind of be uh, processed through system two. So we often think about it in terms of appealing to people's incentives, um, that they are going to sort of in some way pay attention to, to whatever you're asking them to do. And actually, the evidence suggests that system one, so this automatic kind of unconscious processing, has a much bigger influence on our behavior than we'd previously thought. And the, the mind space um, uh, model I'll go through in a minute actually is about introducing the nine um, effects that sort of most powerfully affect us on a kind of unconscious level, and with a particular focus on how you can use them. Um, predictably irrational, um, Oh, I've done it the wrong way. Um, Predictably Irrational is by Dan Ariely. Um, he, again, is a US academic. Um, and his big thing is that economists are wrong um, and that actually it's all, you know, by saying people are rational, that's completely wrong. And actually people are often irrational, um, but in a predictable way. So you saw some work, um, Francesca's actually done some work with uh, Dan about sort of how you can get people to act in different ways, um, about uh, depending on how you prime them. So if you get them to think about being honest, they will act in a different way. Um, and he's done a whole load of work about he's particularly interested in dishonesty. So, for example, some of his work is about how if you get people in a group like this and then you get someone to sort of obviously do something dishonest and if they are clearly associated with your group, then you are much more likely to also be dishonest because, like, you know, unethical behaviour is contagious. Um, and then the final one is Nudge, um, which was published quite a few years ago now. Many of you may have heard of this. Um, and this is about how by framing choices in different ways, you can nudge them in different directions. Um, when, the, when the team originally started, we were often known as the nudge unit. We sort of call ourselves the behavioral insights team because actually nudge is a small component of behavioral insights. But it's a really good way of thinking that actually in many cases, this is about quite small changes to situations or the way you present information. And they can have a really very, very large impact on the type of behavior that you as individuals or also the kind of people you're working with um, have and what they do. So, as it says here, behavioral insights adds another dimension. So I think, again, tradition, it's sometimes seen that behavioral insights is this new separate approach to policy. And when I talk about policy, I mean, obviously, sort of, I'm coming at it as an ex-civil servant, so talking about sort of designing public policy, but I think it equally applies to uh, charitable sectors, getting people, um, so for example, you know, you want people to come and do something or you've offered them some sort of service and they're not taking it up, well, why not? And you can think about it there. So, as I say, originally I think it was often seen as this sort of separate tool, but actually I think it has a real role to play in, it's just another 
tool in a policymaker's toolkit, um, and it can be used either on its own, but actually also it can be used in conjunction with the other more traditional levers of regulation, incentives, and information. And when I'm going through the rest of my presentation, I'll sort of give some illustrations of what I mean by that. So these are two things. Um, East was recommended as your pre-reading, so I'm sure you've all read it cover to cover. Um, but actually, it's also, I know, um, talking to the uh, organisers of the um, event, actually a lot of you have sort of had training on EAST before. Um, and Mindspace, which is the one I'm going to talk to today, uh, was written and published in 2010 by the Institute for Government. It was actually commissioned by the um, Labour government so under uh, Gordon Brown. And this was about drawing together sort of behavioural insights had been sort of floating around in a public policy space. People thought it was quite interesting. And this was designed to kind of pull it together and write it with a view to kind of presenting the um, information in quite an easily digestible way for um, policymakers. If you haven't read either of them, I would recommend both of them. Uh, I'm now going to talk through Mindspace, so hopefully by the end you should be sort of total experts. So, Messenger. So, as it says up here, we are heavily influenced by who communicates information. Now, this is not only about, and you see this a lot, but it's not only about kind of getting a celebrity messenger. It's actually thinking clearly about the type of people you are trying to influence and contact, and who is the most appropriate person to do that. Now, in some cases, government is a brilliant person or brilliant organisation to do that um, because they are perceived to have authority and that is appropriate in that situation. So, for example, um, a local fire service talking to you about something to do with fire safety, that is, in many cases, probably quite a sensible approach. But there will be other situations where really that may not work and actually may have a back, uh, sort of um, counterproductive effect. So the evidence seems to suggest that people um, in lower socioeconomic groups, they need to sort of identify stronger, or more strongly, sorry, with the messenger. Um, and I think sometimes we can, it's useful to just think a bit creatively about how we can spread the messages we want to. So up here it talks about um, expertise, trust and liking, um, and also sort of peer effects. So are there ways that you can kind of use, um, whether it's uh, people who've already done whatever it is you're, you sort of want them to do to kind of explain and maybe demonstrate the benefits of what it is or maybe also actually address p people's particular fears about doing something. Um, so, for example, I'm, we're doing some work at the moment about um, cancer screening. Um, and lots of people, one of the reasons they give for not doing it is they're a bit scared or they have questions. Now, you can sit there as, you know, a member of the NHS and say, oh, this is really good for you to do, it's good for your health, catch it early, all that sort of stuff, the sort of rational messages. But actually, um, in some cases, it's been shown that it's more effective to have sort of, say, uh, if you're thinking about breast screening, sort of women who maybe are from particular groups that are traditionally a bit underrepresented and also talking about their fears and how it worked and that sort of thing. Um, so this is an example I'm going to talk about where we uh, used, adjusted who a message came from. Um, and this is about raising um, money for charity. So we've done quite a lot of work about increasing charitable donations. Um, and this is a piece of work we did with um, a large investment bank. They have a program every year where they um, encourage employees to donate a day's salary to their charity of the year. Um, being investment bankers, they're very well paid. So, you know, we thought this was a good opportunity to sort of play around with some things to see if we could increase those donation rates. So what we did, we had a number of things we tried. Um, in the control group, the people just got an email, which was the standard email. It wasn't personalised, but it was from the CEO of the company just saying today is donated day's uh, salary to charity day. The charity of the year is... Um, I can't actually remember what it was. Anyway, um, is this, um, and you just need to click on this link in order to uh, donate. We then, in a, a separate um, uh, condition, put a small box of sweets on people's desks. So that's what the box looked like. It was quite small, it had a few jelly beans in. Um, I think they cost uh, two pounds per box. Then in the other bit, we personalized the email. So instead of just saying, dear employee, it said, dear Felicity, um, and then was still signed from the CEO. And then in the, we decided to combine them and see what had an effect. So in the control group, 5% of people clicked to donate there um, one day. Give them sweets, doubles it. Uh, Personalising the email actually is more effective than the sweets. Um, and then if you combine it, that's very effective. Um, and the thing there is about 
there's something about somebody contacting you and it coming from a named person which because they were working in this company, they could clearly, they obviously knew who the CEO was and they identified with um, him and the suites as well. I'll talk a little bit in a minute about reciprocity, but there it's about sort of giving a gift. So the combination of those two uh, significantly increased the amount of money going to charity. So incentives. So this, um, as it says up here, our response to incentives are shaped by sort of in predictable ways. So this is not to say that financial incentives don't work. They definitely do. Um, the I mean, there's been a significant drop in the proportion of people smoking. It's not surprising, given if you look at the price of cigarettes over the past sort of 40 years. It obviously does have an effect. But what's really interesting is actually, although financial incentives do work, there are all kinds of ways that you can make the financial incentives more or less effective depending on how you present them. So uh, loss aversion is the fact that we feel losses much more painfully than we feel gains. So if you present something as a loss, then that's more likely to be effective in terms of changing people's behavior. We also discount the future. So if you said to me, would you like 10 pounds today or 12 pounds in a week? Chances are, um, and again, there's evidence that supports this, that I would choose the 10 pounds today. However, if you said to me, would you like £10 in a month or would you like £12 in a month plus a week, then I will tend to wait that little bit longer for £12. So the point there being that it's not a kind of consistent way of, of discounting. Um, and also the fact that we do, we focus a lot on the present. So if you can bring the costs of something to feel very, very sort of imminent, then that again is likely to have more of an effect. Um, and also we overweight small probabilities. So <coughs> this is the idea that lotteries are actually much more effective in many cases because although there might only be a 5% chance, if there's a 5% chance of winning a massive prize, we tend to overly sort of, we often actually expect it to be higher than 5%. Um, so to just explain sort of what, again, give an example. So this was about voter registration. Um, and voter registration is quite, uh, time consuming. So lots of people do register to vote, but there's quite a few that sort of require quite a lot of work to get them to sign up. Um, and if people don't uh, vote, uh, don't sign up, then there's many local authorities will have a series of sort of people go around knocking on doors. Um, and it's quite an intensive, uh, expensive process to get the final few people in. So we thought, well, you know, is there something we could do to try and increase it? So to free up some resources. Um, and here we did we changed the incentives. So as it says up here, what we did was we um, gave people the opportunity to be entered into a prize draw. So at the top of the voter registration form, we did this in um, Southwark in London. Then it just said you and your household could win £5,000 if this form is re returned before the 28th of September. Now previously there was an incentive, but it was kind of a negative incentive. So if you, did, if you failed to register, in theory, you could have been fined £80. Um, I'm not sure actually how often in practice that was uh, imposed. So we tried two things, one of which was a £1,000 prize draw, and the second of which was the £5,000 prize draw to see, you know, obviously there's quite a significant difference in terms of cost to the local authority. Um, so we were just interested in kind of seeing what the different effect was. So in the control group, which was the standard form, 44.8% um, of people registered. Uh, in the £1,000, it was 46.3%, which is actually, uh, from a mathematical perspective, that's a significant difference. Um, interestingly, there was no significant difference whether you did £1,000 or £5,000. Kind of interesting. When we looked into the data a bit more, although at a headline level there was no difference in the proportion of people signing up, actually the £5,000 prize was more effective at getting people from um, more deprived areas signed up. And they traditionally, um, particularly in London, were sort of harder to reach groups because it tended to be kind of more uh, recently arrived communities. So when they were doing their door knocking, they would also often need to take a translator. So there was quite a sort of significant extra cost. But I just think that's quite interesting because it's an effective way of doing it. Um, and in many ways has the potential to be more cost effective because rather than giving everybody some sort of small financial incentive, if you can package it together, uh, the total cost may well be lower, but it may well be more effective. Uh, so that was incentives. Um, norms. So we've heard and some of the comments uh, this morning suggest that actually quite a lot of you know what social norms are, which is great. Um, and it's that we are very, we're social creatures. 
So we take our cues from what other people do, um, and we are all sort of we're looking around constantly to sort of try and help make our judgments. And a very good rule of thumb is, if most people do it, then it's probably okay. Um, so the corollary to that is, if most people do the right thing, then let people know. So in many cases, actually, people, it's quite interesting, there's been some polling work done by Ipsos Mori about people's perceptions of how other people behave. So uh, Francesca gave a great example about how we all think we're sort of very good and above average. Um, but we also it, the, often think that people are worse than they are. So there's been a whole load of um, research done about sort of asking people what their perception is about the number of people who uh, cheat their taxes, the number of people who behave in other kind of unethical ways. And people almost always overestimate how bad other people are. So why don't we just try and correct that by telling them that actually most people do the desired behavior. Um, a key thing with social norms is that people identify with it. So that's what I mean by personalize the norm. So telling, I don't know, me that, I don't know, nine out of 10, I'm, trying, I'm struggling to think of an example, but something I don't identify with may well just be less uh, likely to influence me than if you say nine out of 10, 30-ish um, old women, year old-ish women uh, in Manchester do this particular behavior because that's you know, who I am. Um, and then the thing up here, beware of boomerangs, probably sounds slightly cryptic. And what that means is that actually a danger with presenting social norms is that you can worsen the behavior of those who are sort of performing better. So a good example of this is on um, energy efficiency. So they did some work where they told people what their energy usage was in comparison to their neighbor. Um, and the idea being that this would sort of help uh, reduce energy usage by those who used more energy. Um, and in the initial thing, what they actually did was they actually meant that people who were using less energy, so i.e. kind of better from the policy perspective, they actually started using more because they were like, oh, you know, I'm not in the norm. So they adjusted their behavior. Now, the way they overcame that was they just put a smiley face on. So to sort of say, you're doing better than average and, you know, that's really good. Um, so that's what we mean by boomerangs is actually, are you, is there a danger that you might pull people the wrong way? And there's, um, I think sometimes public sector, so we, I saw a great example of this in Manchester Town Hall the other week where there was a sign in the ladies' toilet that said 95% of people don't wash their hands properly, um, which is exactly what you don't want to promote. And one of my colleagues went to Glastonbury and apparently there was a massive sign saying 25% of people leave their tent which again is not actually something they want to do. So it does require a little bit of kind of nuanced thinking about it and making sure that you are getting people A, to identify with the norm you're telling them about, but B, actually to sort of pull them in the right direction rather than accidentally making it worse. So we use this um, to reduce antibiotic prescribing. So this is a paper, um, I didn't work on it, my colleague uh, Michael Hallsworth did, um, which has recently been published in The Lancet. As I'm sure most of you know, Antimicrobial resistance, massive public policy problem, um, really difficult to tackle, lots and lots of work going on about trying to get people to develop new kinds of job, uh, drugs, all extremely important. Now, we were thinking, okay, well, what could you do? One of the big things is um, prescribing behavior of GPs. This is often as seen as quite a difficult behavior to influence. Um, and what we decided to do, because actually prescribing data is collected and in theory is sort of looked at by some sort of overseeing officer in local areas. But we weren't sure that um, doctors were aware of this. So we wrote to doctors who prescribed sort of higher than average levels of antibiotics. Um, the letter on the left, I don't think you'll be able to read properly, so I've kind of pulled out the main points from it. Um, it's sent to a named GP. Um, and then the first thing says, the great majority, brackets 80% of practices in Manchester, London, Cardiff, you know, whatever the local area was, prescribe fewer antibiotics per head than yours. Um, and then we had three actionable steps. And this was actually, a lot of it was focused around giving GPs something else to do. Because one of the things um, through sort of uh, research we'd done that we'd heard was that GPs often felt a sort of pressure from patients because they would come in and say, but I need antibiotics. And they, in some cases, it's just easier to sort of give in and give somebody a prescription. And especially if maybe you're not quite sure and you think, okay, fine. Um, so it was about giving them a, a leaflet about sort of self-care. Also um, thinking about increasing the number of delayed prescriptions. So I didn't realize this till quite recently, but actually your GP can give you a G, uh, prescription that isn't kind of 
filled for a certain period. Um, and then the third thing was about talking to your colleagues to sort of think about what you could do to help with this problem. Um, and then it was signed by um, Sally Davis, so England's chief medical officer. So that's all about kind of personalization, um, making it seem important because obviously she is well known. Um, <coughs> so at the beginning of the, the trial in September, so this was in um, 2014, both groups, so the control group and the treatment group, um, prescribed about the same amount. Um, it's antibiotic items dispensed per thousand weight of prescription. The point being, I mean, it's <coughs> a sort of absolute measure isn't that important. It's just to sort of show that the two groups are the same. Um, and then we sent the letter. So we sent the letter in uh, uh, September. And in the control group, you can see, as you would expect, higher levels of prescription in the winter because, you know, it's winter, people get sick. Um, and then that was in the treatment group. And actually, that, the whole point is a significant difference between the two groups. And what I think is particularly interesting, um, and we're often asked about kind of the, the length of the effect of these different interventions. It was one letter sent in September, but the difference was still significant in the following March, which is quite amazing, considering this is a really quite tricky problem. Um, and then what we did is we actually sent the control group the uh, letter in April, um, and at that point, the, the difference disappeared, suggesting that it really was a result of our intervention. So, um, as it says here, the letter saved 73,000 doses across about 800 practices. Um, if you'd sent everybody the letters, it's about 0.85% reduction in antibiotic prescribing. Um, and also, aside from the fact that this is a good thing because of antibiotic resistance, it's actually also a really quite significant cost saving as well um, in terms of those prescriptions that are not issued. Um, so again, a quite nice illustration of how what are seemingly very small interventions can have a surprisingly large and very cost effective um, impact on what are very tricky problems. I mean, we're not saying you're going to get rid of antimicrobial resistance just by sending some letters, but this is a component of the whole thing. Um, so defaults. So this is uh, a kind of quite widely discussed topic, um, I suppose particularly in Wales, given the kind of organ donor decisions about opt-in, opt-out. But the, the underlying thing is that we are wired towards inertia. Now, that's not to mean that we are lazy. Um, it's just that, you know, effort, it's effortful to kind of deviate from the kind of existing course of action. Now, when you're thinking, that's quite a powerful way when you're thinking about how you are setting up what happens to people. So what happens if people do nothing in the situation that you are sort of thinking about them in? Um, people take the easiest option. So can you set the easiest option to be them doing nothing? So... Um, even important decisions are delayed or ignored. So even where there are situations where we think, gosh, you know, people have a real incentive here to think about this. So there's some, been some work done about um, university admissions. That seems like something that people should be thinking about and should, you know, be paying quite a lot of attention to because it's not a mundane routine activity. This is a big deal. And actually by changing the default in terms of information provision, then you can have a very big effect on whether people do or don't go to university. Um, now, when we talk about defaults, Sometimes there is very legitimate uh, reaction and uh, objection to setting a default in a particular way. Um, now, one way of sort of kind of meeting in the middle is to have a prompted choice. So you don't decide what's going to happen if people do nothing, but you force them to make a decision um, and that there is some process beyond which and you cannot, they will not be able to sort of pass through it unless they have made a choice. Um, so, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, um, pensions in the UK switched in 2012 from being opt-in, so the idea being that people had to decide to have a pension to opt out, um, and the point there being that most people say they would like to save for a pension, but many people didn't get round to it. Um, and these are the results from that. So before auto-enrolment, um, in large firms, about 61% of people had a pension. After auto-enrolment, about 83%. So the opt-out rate was about 10%. So nine out of 10 people kind of stuck with the default. Um, and actually, the biggest difference is in medium firms. Now, what's not quite clear is whether that's because in some cases, medium firms didn't have pension schemes and they're now forced to, or whether there is some sort of big difference between the type of people who work for medium-sized firms versus uh, 
large firms. And what I think is particularly interesting about this and kind of a good thing is that actually not everybody has opted in. So that people are still, because there will definitely be situations where people do not want to save to a pen, for a pension or it's not appropriate for them to. Um, so this is the thing about the sort of prompted choice, or sorry, not prompted choice, but the, the default is a kind of, it's a step down from just banning something or forcing everybody to do something. Um, and that means that people do still retain some sort of control over what they are or aren't doing. All right. Um, so salience. So this is about sort of things seeming novel and relevant. So we all have loads and loads of information to process every day, lots of things we're thinking about, all this sort of stuff. So we're actually pretty good at filtering out most of it. Um, and so, you know, when you're writing to people, when you're contacting people, trying to get them to do stuff, you need to somehow grab their attention. And this isn't, I mean, part of it is about making things look physically attractive, but it's also about personalization. Um, it relates quite closely to the sort of social norms where I was talking about and saying, look, the norm is more effective when people uh, identify with it. Um, but it's about sort of making it interesting, novel, um, also keeping things simple. So making it salient, like what you want them actually to do. Um, so if you're writing them a letter, tell them in the first line, like, this is what I want you to do. Whereas often what we do when we write a letter is we spend quite a long time explaining the context and the background and all that sort of stuff. <coughs> um, so this is about attracting the attention of owners of untaxed vehicles. So we did some work with DVLA. This was a few years ago now. So this was if you'd been caught um, driving your vehicle untaxed. You got a letter um, and a fine. And this, previously the letter um, said, uh, our latest information sh shows you have not taxed your vehicle. So we tried two different things. Um, in the first one, we said, pay your tax or lose your Honda, uh, Ford, whatever it was. Um, you have been caught driving your Honda, Ford, um, untaxed. And the idea being there that, oh gosh, yeah, actually that is mine. Um, and sort of making it more, feel more relevant to people um, by just sort of highlighting that it, we know that it's you and it is your Honda. Um, and then in the third one, what we did was we included, so the, the message at the top is the same, it still says pay, pay your um, vehicle tax or lose your Honda. But then we also included an image of the untaxed car. Now the way this existed, so it wasn't like suddenly we were sort of sending out an army of photographers. The way that untaxed cars were um, picked up is through the um, number plate recognition cameras that are around. So, DBLA already had this data, and it was just simply a case of kind of printing it on the letter. Um, and the idea there was you were making it really salient. So A, it's quite novel, because you don't usually get letters from DBLA with a picture in it, but also actually it's really jumping out as being you, because it's your car, it's your number plate, you know, there's not really getting any away, any getting away. So when Francesca was saying this morning that we're all quite good at sort of slightly fudging the truth, there's, it's very difficult to sort of look at this and think, oh, it wasn't me. Um, and here are what the results were. So with the original letter, about 40% of people paid their tax. Um, with the new letter, that went up by two percentage points. Um, putting the image on had a really big effect. So again, this is, I mean, there are some costs here in terms of it's slightly more difficult to print a letter with a photo on, but not significant um, and had a really big impact in terms of the amount of um, uh, road tax that was being paid. So priming. So this is where I admit that actually it's the one uh, trial that the results I was going to present, Francesca has uh, already presented, partly, well, mainly because it was her trial. But um, <laughs> also, I do have another example. Um, so this is how we take cues. So the point of like, the fact that we are influenced, we are social beings and we take our cues from other people, we also take cues from the environment. So... Um, as was discussed a bit this morning, um, exposure to words, sights, smells, kind of our, our emotions at different times can affect how we, res we respond to things. Um, the size of plates and portion sizes. Um, but this one, it is worth saying, is the one that, as it says up here, is sort of the most controversial and least understood. Now, what do I mean by that? It has consistently been found that priming people to think in certain ways, so prompting them to think honestly, um, or prompting them to think there's been some work about if you uh, get people to think about being elderly, then when they leave the um, lab where the experiment was done, they sort of walked a bit more slowly and kind of stooped. 
Um, now, all those effects have been found to exist, but what the difference is that they have often been in quite a controlled laboratory setting. In the real world, it is not clear whether they are strong enough to have that big of an effect. So Francesca talked this morning about the um, trial about the signature at the bottom of the form and the signature at the top. Um, one of the others, which I actually really like, is around um, eating. So there's been some work done. <laughs> so people were given soup bowls that refill themselves from the bottom. Um, and they were asked to just sort of keep eating until they were full. Um, and the people where the bowls were just normal, and they kind of ate their soup, fine. And they could go back and fill up, but the point was with the self-filling ones, there was sort of a tube underneath that filled it back up. Um, so the difference between the self-filling and the ones that were just the bowl, then people ate 73% more soup where it was being refilled. But also, the key thing is, because it still looked as though they had some left at the end, they said they felt less full than the people, even though they'd eaten like basically twice as much soup. And the point being that the priming, so this is all about the sort of relative decisions. So we are very bad at making absolute decisions. We are really excellent at making relative decisions. Um, so, and this kind of relates to incentives, sort of how you frame an incentive relative to other things can affect how it, how it is um, perceived and how it is acted upon. Um, so yeah, the priming one, I think is quite an interesting one, so particularly, I think there's a reason that for a long time we got people to swear on the Bible before they sort of gave their testimony at court. And there is quite a powerful thing, and I think there's quite a lot you can do. There's been some really interesting work um, around sort of what are called values affirmations. So where if you get people to think about why they are doing something and why it is important to them, then that can have a very significant effect on their subsequent performance. Um, so we did some work with um, Avon and Somerset Police about uh, increasing diversity of recruitment because they have a big problem with, through their application process, um, a big drop-off of non-white applicants. And what we did is we worked with them and we looked at their recruitment process and we noticed that in the very first stage, it's kind of an email um, test you have to do, an online test. Um, so we decided to change that. And what we did is we changed the email we sent. So in the new email, we sent everybody, and it sort of still had the same instructions, but it had a, a phrase at the top that said, please take a moment to think about why becoming a police officer is important to you and your community. Um, and that, I'm afraid I don't have the slide because this was the slide I was going to present, um, actually reduced completely the differential pass rates. So previously, it had been 40% of BME applicants had passed the test and 60% of white applicants. After we changed that email, then that difference completely disappeared. So it was a 60% pass rate in both. And what was really great is not only have we got rid of the difference, we hadn't made the pass rate for white applicants any worse. So um, this, I just think, is super fascinating. That is, I mean, the fact that just that one little thing of saying to people, can you please think about this, has such a big effect. And there's also been done work done about how if you label uh, tests as different types of things, then it can have an effect on um, uh, performance by different genders. So traditionally, girls tend to do worse at maths at school. And they've done some stuff where if you called a, a test a maths test, then the girl's pass rate was much lower. And if you called it something like a test of reasoning and drawing or something, which is basically sort of geometry and algebra, then there was no difference in the pass rate. So, but this one is a kind of tricky one, but I do think is definitely worth uh, thinking about. So affect. So as we talked a bit about this morning, um, emotional associations can have a very, very big influence on our actions. So as I've already said, that actually our responses are very, very quick. So there's, um, I was looking at some work recently about people interviewing, um, so in recruitment. And on average in interviews, people make their judgment within, I think it's the first two minutes of an interview, and they spend the subsequent 58 minutes, if it's an hour-long interview, sort of looking for evidence to support that. Um, so that's known as confirmation bias, so the fact that you sort of tend to pay attention to evidence that supports your theories. Um, but anyway, back to effect. So there's also a big difference between kind of hot and cold states. So sometimes, you know, this is a, a sort of eating is a good example of this, where, um, you know, you think about it and you think, yes, I'm definitely going to eat my salad for lunch. It'll be amazing. And then, you know, it's lunchtime, you've had a bit of a crummy morning, and you go, and it's like, mm, do I want the salad, or do I want these really delicious curly fries, which someone's just presented to me? Um, the decision is often very different. Um, this, again, is a, an example relating to charitable giving. 
So this was about getting people to leave charitable gifts in their wills, which, as I'm sure Ruth knows, is a sort of perennial thing that charities are trying to increase. Um, and lots of people say they would like to leave money in their will, but they don't. Um, you know. So we worked with a firm of will writers. So this was where you ring up over the telephone. Um, and we tried a number of things. So we did the standard you know, just writing a will so you weren't prompted at all. It was just if people sort of spontaneously decided to leave a gift. Um, then we did what is up here called Just Ask. So we just said, uh, many people like to leave a um, gift in their will. Would you like to? And people say yes or no. Um, and then the third one was sort of about getting people to be in a particular emotional state because we said, um, do you have... So many people like to leave a, a gift in their will. Um, do you have any causes that you are passionate about? Um, so, again, people were free to say no. Um, in the control condition, 5% of people sort of spontaneously decided to leave um, a, a gift. Um, in the just ask, that doubled. Um, and when you got them to think about, is there something that's passionate about? Um, it went up to 15%. And what's also particularly interesting, I think, here is there was a big difference in the size of donations. So it wasn't only whether people gave, it was also the amount they gave. Um, so this is a kind of an, also a nice illustration about when you're measuring the effect of things you do. Sometimes, actually, it's not only the kind of headline figure, it's also the sort of slightly more nuanced. In this case, both sort of went in the same direction, so the passion ask was more effective on both outcomes. Um, and the hot and st cold state, I think, is a particularly interesting one depending on, I mean, I know we've got a whole range of backgrounds here, but so things like um, crime and that sort of stuff, how you think you might react in different situations and then how you react in the heat of the moment are often very different. Um, so C is for commit. Um, and this is that we like to think of ourselves as consistent um, and we like to sort of, you know, appear to be publicly consistent. Um, and also that we reciprocate acts. So I talked a little bit a little while ago about the um, giving people sweets uh, for, their, for the charitable donations, um, and that was a good example of reciprocity. So when I talk about commit, so commitment devices up there, so what do I mean by those? I mean that it's where you sort of, as it, the name suggests, you commit what to do, but to make it more effective, then the, it, it helps if you make it public and you write it down. Um, and also, actually, that you have somebody to sort of monitor you. So a really nice everyday example of this is, you know, running a marathon for charity. You may well quite want to run a marathon for charity, but, you know, or, sorry, you may well quite want to run a marathon. You know you probably won't, so you're like, well, I'm going to do it for charity. And then to make it kind of really binding, you tell everybody about it and get them to pay the charity. Um, and that, again, is a kind of really powerful motivator. So when at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning and it's pouring with rain, you don't really want to go for your run then you've got some sort of constraint um, there to sort of encourage you. Um, as I've written up here, people can actively choose to constrain their future self. So we often know that we are kind of inconsistent. Um, and we know that, you know, oh gosh, yeah, I did really mean to get round to that. And are there ways that you can get people to sort of commit to their future self? So I was talking um, a little bit, uh, a little while ago, about how we feel things in the present very strongly compared to how we feel them in the future. Um, now, a good way of sort of tapping into this is that because we care less about our future self than we do about our present self, can we get ourselves to sort of make our future self be better? Um, so a good example of this is about getting people to save for pensions. In America, they've done quite a lot of work on a program that's called Save More Tomorrow, where you ask people if they'd like to save their pension today. Many of them say no, because you don't want to give up kind of money from your wages that month. But then you also ask people, well, would you like to save for a pension in three months' time? And the, a significant number of people do sign up to that because they do want to save for a pension and they know it's a good thing. So if you give them an opportunity to sort of do it but move some of that pain away, they are willing to commit their future self to be a sort of better, a better person. And reciprocity. So um, this is the idea that if you do something for me, um, and it's kind of costly, then I am more likely to do something back to you. Even when actually, on an objective level, the, the sort of ratio of cost, if you want to call it that, isn't the same. So the example I gave before about the charitable donation with the sweets, as I said, the cost of the um, box of sweets was about two pounds. 
I don't know what the average day salary was in the investment bank, but it's definitely much higher than two pounds. But as the result showed, um, it had a very, very uh, significant effect in terms of soliciting more donations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we did about how, helping people to find employment. Now, um, part of this work, so this was quite a large program of work we did a couple of years ago. It involved us going to work in a job centre in Essex for three months to understand kind of what happened. And we did a whole load of things, including kind of redesigning the process, um, getting people to sort of think about their strengths, all that sort of stuff. But one important component of it was about getting people to commit. So previously, what had happened when you went into your job center was you had to demonstrate that you had done three job searches in the previous two weeks in order to qualify for Job Seekers Allowance. Um, and we changed that around so that instead of talking about what you've done in the previous two weeks, you talked about what you were going to do in the next two weeks, um, and specifically that you committed to what you were going to do. So the, the table on the left, I don't know how much of it you can see, but that is, um, these packs have actually been rolled out across um, the UK now, but that was what we called the claimant commitment pack. So it had your name um, and it had the date at the top. And then what you had to do was fill in, sort of saying what you were going to do in the next two weeks. And this was as specific as, on a Wednesday morning, I will, after I've dropped my children at school, I will spend two hours revising my CV. Um, and then there's that you had to sign it. Is, so you had to sort of, you know, put your name to your commitment. Um, and then there's a box for the outcome. So you had to explain kind of what had happened. Um, and then at the end, there's the signature for your job centre advisor. And the idea being there that in two weeks, you would go back and your job centre advisor would say, so, CV, Wednesday, how did it go? Um, and you would either say, great, you know, here is my revised CV, or you'd sort of say, mm, it didn't work out. Um, and the thing I think is interesting here is not only commitment, but this is also another example, I'm not quite sure where it fits into the Mindspace sort of acronym, but about helping people break things up into small steps and actually small, sometimes called chunking in the sort of uh, jargon, but rather than like find a job, it's really, really difficult, like what do I do to find a job? Um, it's about helping people identify those sort of individual steps that help add up to find them a job. So revise your CV, and then the next thing that would on the commitment pack might have been spend two hours um, on Monster looking for relevant jobs to apply for, and the outcome would be the sort of demonstration that you'd applied for those jobs. Um, so as I said, this was quite a small component of a much larger piece of work, but it was an extremely important component um, and has now been rolled out across the UK. So the effect of that, um, in the treatment group who just got the standard job centre process in uh, Loughton in Essex, 51% of them at the end of 13 weeks were no longer claiming job seekers allowance. Um, it's worth saying that the reason we measured 13 weeks is not we think this is some sort of super amazing kind of level. This is the data that's already collected by DWP. So that was why we used that. Um, in the treatment group, it was 60%. Now, that looks like an amazing effect. It is worth caveating it slightly by saying that when we looked back, there were actually some differences between the two groups. So the, the treatment effect was um, five percentage points. Um, but that still, for those of you who work in employment, know that that is a really quite chunky change for something that, I mean, it was not, this is not as cheap as just changing a letter, um, but it's definitely much cheaper than kind of, you know, changing the sanctioning process, all the other sort of stuff. Um, and then this is the final one. So this is ego. So you all learned about how you have massive egos this morning um, and that we are all massively above average in terms of, you know, our ability to negotiate. One of my favorite stats is that 93% um, of US college students think they are a better than average driver. Um, you know. <laughs> um, and this is, so attribution error is that if something goes well, we tend to sort of think, oh, yes, I did that really well. If something goes wrong, we say, oh, well, it was the situation or the circumstances, rather than objectively looking at it. Um, we also massively overestimate our own abilities, as has been demonstrated. And what that means is that actually um, we tend to be sort of overly optimistic about how we will behave, so often kind of have unrealistic expectations. Um, and we also think of ourselves as consistent, and we're not. What's quite interesting is the evidence suggests that um, if you've got beliefs and behaviour then your beliefs are much more likely to shift to be consistent with your behaviour than the other way around, even though you would have thought it would have been that attitudes and beliefs were an extremely important um, kind of, they led to the change in behaviour. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
This, I think, is quite an interesting one. So I actually don't have an example for this one um, because it's, it's a sort of slightly tricky one. But I think there are examples of where you have used it. So the example I gave about pensions, that you think of yourself in future as someone who saves. So can you tap into, tap into that? You can also sort of use it, so a way of countering this. So we might know that people are over-optimistic is to get people, so to sort of de-bias, if that's quite the right word, is to get people to imagine that the situation they are facing or what they're planning and how they're going to do it is actually being done by someone else because we're much more objective when we're considering other people's behaviours and chances of success. So a good opportunity of how this might manifest itself is around things like project planning. So we tend to be very over-optimistic about how quickly we're going to do things, all that sort of stuff. Now, a good way to sort of maybe bring some realism into either budget planning or time planning is to get a kind of external group to look and then provide you with comments and feedbacks and say, look, you know, you've said you're going to do this in six weeks. Is that really realistic? Um, and it's also about sometimes providing data back. So um, uh, Francesca was talking about this morning about how we often sort of go with our gut instinct even when the data doesn't hold. Um, and I think something about providing feedback and also providing this sort of external um, challenge. And that is it. So that's the summary. Um, hopefully, as I said, I know we've got a sort of mixed background, so I hope you've all found something new and interesting um, in that. And also that kind of quite nicely, I think, complements the um, talk this morning. So we've got, um, I don't know, about 15 minutes for questions. Is that right? Yeah? I don't know. Are you? Yeah, thanks very much, Felicity. And it'd um, be great to get some um, questions from um, anybody who's got them. And again, if we could maybe just take a couple to start with, give Felicity a chance to maybe have a sip of water and just uh, um, uh, reflect and maybe give a couple of answers at a time, and then we'll move on to another couple of questions. So who wants to um, have go first to ask any questions about Mindspace? Thank you. Or, um, work that thank you very much indeed there's a roving mic probably coming in just a moment keep your hand up so somebody with a mic can, oh there you are Grant. thank you very much um i'm can you hear me yeah i'm i'm interested in health behaviors you know the nudge around people's well-being and taking responsibility for their health in the future you know things like um planning your pension it's quite a, you make that decision it's done whereas with health behaviors it's something you have to do consistently yeah. every day what's the evidence showing around well-being and health so um, health is an interesting one because there's actually quite a lot of evidence around um, sort of one-off interventions and getting people. So there's been quite a lot of work done, for example, around um, weight loss and how you get people to sort of stick. And it seems that providing people feedback um, makes them more likely to uh, lose weight. As far as I know, there hasn't been that much follow-up of saying, because so one paper in particular I'm thinking of, they sort of followed up four months later, but then they didn't follow up two years later um, and the public health issue around kind of smoking cessation and obesity and all that sort of stuff I think basically the evidence is not amazing at the moment um, but there is increasing work being done in it so public health England um, are doing quite a lot around as you would expect public health but also maybe slightly less related to things like obesity and smoking there's been lots and lots of work done around um, sort of public health in terms of getting people to go to screening um, and sort of preventative public health so it's not quite the same as healthy living but it definitely is about kind of caring for yourself there's also um, we're doing some work at the moment um, in Moldova actually about um, getting people to take their TB medication and different ways you can do that we don't have the results from that trial yet but I think it's tended at the moment to focus on things like getting people to turn up for screening. So where there are public health programs and maybe people aren't doing them. We've also done some work about getting people to attend their NHS health check. We're still in the early stages. So I can't sort of say this will help. Um, but it is gaining prominence, which I think is a good thing. So, Gentlemen at the back, there's a, probably a mic coming in just a moment. Hi, I'm uh, John from Public Health. Um, <laughs> I'm really, uh, really interested in um, you know the evidence on uh, this approach for uh, behaviour change and health behaviour change particularly. So that's a really good question, and um, I think there is a lot of evidence actually about how you know 
making things easy, applying that yeast formula influences people's food choices and uh, you know healthy choices at you know the, the point of making them. So I think there's there's quite a bit around that that we could probably do better. I'm um, just interested in uh, whether there's been any application of this, particularly around um, engaging volunteers and you know developing co-production within communities. I think that's something probably all of us are interested in in terms of you know, being able to activate communities to take on a role with public services to, you know, make their place a better place to live. Um, so again, this is one I'm not quite sure. Uh, we have, so we've started doing some work um, on what's called sort of mobilising communities. So I'm sure lots of you who work in health have probably heard of that sort of phrase. Um, and that's working with a number of local areas to look at how you get people to sort of, as you say, sort of work within existing communities, but kind of, there's a lot of discussion. I'm sure many of you recognize the phrase of asset-based approaches, so sort of using existing things. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting around health and social care, so we've talked to quite a lot of local authorities who are worried that when people are starting to receive social care, that it actually often it comes at a point of crisis. Mm. Um, and previously, people had been sort of managing reasonably well with quite a lot of informal support. And that at that point of crisis, often those networks will fall away because suddenly it's like, oh, well, I now receive care. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I think could be a very interesting application, now I don't know whether this would work, is trying some of that kind of commitment approach that we use to unemployment, but to that first discussion with a potential care recipient. So instead of saying, what can't you do? It's about saying, okay, right, well, what can you do? Um, and getting people to think more like that and then focusing on the stuff they can already do. And maybe it's about getting people to commit that I will do it for, I'll have this program for six months, this package of support, and then after six months, we'll review it. Um, so I think, I, and I, I should also say that I am not a health expert. So um, we have a health team, if you'd like, I'm very happy to kind of put you in touch with them. They will know the evidence much better than I do. But I think, yeah, it's kind of, it's early stages, um, and we are working on this uh, mobilising communities work, and also another programme work called Realising the Value, which again is sort of tapping into these existing community assets and how you can get people to self-care. Um, and one of the interesting approaches, I think, is taken from anthropology, which is, um, the approach is called positive deviance, and it's kind of looking at where there are populations doing anything that is largely kind of not particularly good, but some of them do it well, what's different about those groups and can you, given that they have developed the kind of ability to sort of, whether it's manage their own health condition well or a whole host of other situations, how can you take that and sort of apply it to people who are like them but for some reason there's something sort of different uh, there. One of the interesting connections in relation to the question about public health and co-production is that there's a big lottery funded project Public Health Wales are involved with and a whole range of other partners um, around co-production and I think some of the links between stuff that we do in Wales really really well we're a small clever connected country and being able to feed that back to colleagues um, who are experts in other fields and who are doing such interesting work not just in other parts of the UK but overseas so I think that's a really interesting additional connection that comes out today. Yeah. I know Joe's, um, Joe's got a question. Ah, okay well, so just question. one point I was going to make as well so one of the things we often do when we're working on a project is spend quite a lot of time thinking actually what behaviour we want to change because I think it's quite easy and being quite specific about it because it's quite easy to talk in sort of general terms like we would like people to be healthier and my point earlier about sort of breaking things up into smaller chunks so we'd like people to find a job okay but what what are the steps to help people do that and I think that's one of the things when you're sort of thinking about different approaches and applying these because these are often very small changes so you need to apply them to small things um, in many cases. So being clear, is it that you want people to go to an appointment? Is it that you want them to do something in a different way? Brilliant. Thanks, Felicity. Any uh, questions on the floor? Yeah, we've got two now, and then we'll come to Joe in a moment. So one person in a purple, purple top that I can see, a microphone coming down, and then a person right on the side with a blue top. So the microphone's going to the blue top first, I'm afraid. So, okay. Oh, no, we've got you. one. Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, he's already got a microphone. Oh, he's got a mic. Oh, beg your pardon. Couldn't see. Hello, I'm over here. I'm the okay. blue top. Uh, my, my name's Paul Dunning, and I work for ABM U Health Board. Um, it was just to pick up on your final point around, I don't know whether I misheard, around kind of behaviour having a kind of strong influence on thinking. 
and often the opposite is kind of you know the kind of normal way to look at it often the, the, the supposition is that our thinking has a stronger influence on behavior yeah so i was just intrigued to hear what you said there and whether you could unpack that a little bit more Please. Yeah, so I think the, the sort of site you heard correctly, which I said that the evidence suggests that people's attitudes change to be consistent with their behaviour rather than the other way around, even though often we spend a lot of time trying to change attitudes. Um, why that is, uh, we don't exactly know. I think the, one of the kind of strongest explanations is that we like to... So the whole point about commitment is we like to think about ourselves as consistent... Now, if you have quite a concrete demonstration of a behaviour you have you've done, then you will often be like, oh, OK, well, I've done that, so let's try and explain why that is. And you can sort of shift your beliefs or attitudes to be consistent with that behaviour. From a more practical note, also, it's much easier to change behaviour, in many cases, than it is to change attitudes. So, you know, focus on the easy win and kind of get people to do things differently. Um, and I often have this discussion with people who are interested in recycling, and I'm purposely being sort of somewhat provocative when I say, because they say, well, we want to get people to sort of care about recycling, know why it's important. <laughs> now, if you're being kind of, as I say, I'm purposely being sort of slightly antagonistic here, but why? Why do we care like, that people know that recycling is a good thing? We want them to recycle. Um, so it's not always as clear-cut. I'm caricaturing a bit, but I think sometimes the point, and I made a little bit about just focusing on what behaviour you want to change... Because once you've got, even if it's quite a small change, you can use that to potentially sort of pull um, beliefs and attitudes and, you know, if, if that is still something that you think is a kind of desirable um, approach. But, yeah, behaviours are easier to change, so do that. You know. Hi, um, my name is Phil. Um, I suppose the question I was wanted to ask was in relation to the piece of work you did on um, antimicrobial prescribing, because effectively it was demand management in one way or another and I suppose in healthcare in particular we know that in a number of our areas we have demand so has there been any further research or work done to sort of translate that into reducing demand in other aspects of care or in other areas? So we did do some work about um, trying to reduce A&E demand which is obviously another hot topic um, and that involved when people had been to A&E and they perhaps could have gone elsewhere sending them a follow-up letter and sort of saying, did you know these are other options? Now, we didn't actually in that uh, situation see a reduction in subsequent demand. What we're not quite sure is whether that because the letter on its own wasn't effective or whether because actually there were quite a few kind of practical complications in terms of how that was all done and particularly um, the, the number of people the letters were sent to. So from a statistical perspective, we don't really know whether it didn't work or just we don't have enough people to say it didn't work. Um, di I mean, we've also done sort of the opposite of demand management, I guess, which is demand increase. So the stuff around NHS health checks. So how you get more people to go along to those, how you get more people um, to go along to cancer screening. We did some work on do not attend at hospitals, which is not strictly demand management, but is sort of in terms of it's a massive drain on resources if people don't turn up for their appointments. And there we tried just a number of text messages. So hospitals already, quite a lot of them do send text messages. Um, and we tried a few things, one of which was making it easy. So to say, your appointment's on this date, ring this number if you need to rearrange, rather than you've got an appointment, please call us to rearrange. So just by providing the number. So if you've got a smartphone, you can press the link. Um, we also um, then did uh, one around um, social norms, so saying... Um, most nine out of ten people turn up for their appointment, which is in the hospital we were working in was true. Um, and then the one that was actually most effective was the easy, so saying you've got an appointment, call this number to rearrange. Um, each missed appointment costs, it costs the NHS £160. Again, that is a factually true statement. We've got the costs from um, the, the sort of tariff list, and that reduced the, the, the do not attends from 11% in the control condition, which just you've got a normal text, to 8%. Um, so three percentage points for the cost of a text message, um, you know, is not bad. But yeah, demand management, I think, actually is a very common theme across lots of our work, whether it's in health, council services, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I think that's, it's, there's so much scope for applying a lot of this stuff to that. Brilliant. Yeah. No. The microphone could go to the middle. Thanks very much indeed. My name's Rob Battenstead from uh, PHW. Um, in terms of the messenger, I just wondered how important 
uh, family members are as, as messengers. So is it better, for example, rather than trying to influence older people directly to go to bowel screening, actually have a campaign um, with younger people to get them to persuade their grandparents to go and have bowel screening, for example? Is so I don't know the answer to that specific question, but I think there are reasons to think that family members are often very powerful influencing factors. Um, and I think this is the sort of caveat to that is with a lot of this stuff, context matters, which is why we test things as far as possible. Um, I think if I, was, if I was approaching the problem, what I would also do is sort of look around and see what people already do. So when people are thinking about bowel screening, do they talk to friends and family about it? Um, they may well do, they might not. Um, and also thinking about can you use what are sometimes sort of called network nudges, which is where you can get someone who's done whatever it is you want to do, and then they sort of recommend or encourage people they know. Um, so it could be that someone gets, you know, they do their bowel screening and actually it's fine, and then you sort of say to them, look, could you please talk to five of your friends and encourage them? Um, I think bowel screening is an interesting one because it's a bit sort of, the process is not the most pleasant process either. Um, I know all screening is not great, but bowel screening in particular sort of has significant challenges. Um, so it, it would be interesting to think about sort of what people already do and whether friends and family. There's been some interesting work done on domestic abuse, which I know is a very different situation, but actually they found that there some of the most effective messages were kind of appealing to, I mean, it's primarily men who do this, but um, their sort of role as fathers mm -hmm. and from their children. Um, because for that, that was a very important kind of motivator for them. And that's a good example of the messenger is not the police saying, if you do this, we're going to lock you up, because that, that doesn't seem to be as effective. Right at the back. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Hi. Um, is it working? Yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, Cassie Taylor from Qualifications Wales. Um, I'm just thinking about, um, you, you've given a, a number of examples of kind of projects that have been, in effect, research, but um, testing out ideas. I'm, I'm just wondering about getting the, those um, findings rolled out. So is it, do you see it as the role for the, in a sense, the customer to roll that out? Or, or you know, is that something that researchers can can do more widely, other than at events like this, obviously. But you know, it's, it's translating things from the small example to widespread good practice that I think might be you know, a real challenge. Yeah, I think, I mean, the dissemination of good practice and evidence, I think, is a perennial problem for all kinds of organisations and situations. In answer to your question, do I think it's the role of kind of customer, so I presume by that you mean the people, we, the organisations we've worked with. I think it's probably a bit of both, like, so we, as far as possible, always publish our results, but obviously not everybody, like, far from everybody comes and kind of looks at our website. Um, there is also a role for professional bodies. I think actually also I think that sort of training for um, policy professionals should also get them to sort of almost as quite an early stage of whatever they're doing think, well, what is the evidence on this, yeah. rather than just diving headlong into addressing a problem? Um, because we find it time and time again, we sort of talk to local authorities and they're interested in the same issues. Um, and in many cases, you know, I mean, council tax collection, although I'm talking about the importance of testing, there are kind of broad things. So um, the framework East, people often say, well, what's the most important one? Well, make it easy. Like, that's not, I mean, it's slightly more nuanced than just making it sort of easy to understand, but as a very first step, just make things easy to understand. And I think there's something about making it easy for people to find out what other people are doing. It's a tricky problem. I think there's probably a whole host of organizations who have a role to play in that dissemination of um, best practice and evidence. Thanks very much, Mike. Yeah, hello, uh, yeah, Mike Palmer, Wales Audit Office. Uh, this is more a, a sort of helpful comment, hopefully, than a, than a question, picking up on the disseminating good practice uh, point. Uh, my colleague, Chris Bolton, who runs the uh, good practice arm in Wales Audit Office, is currently undertaking a major study on uh, behaviour change uh, in, in Wales and um, is, uh, is all currently organising an event for September, which is designed in Swansea, which is designed to sort of 
uh, pull that good practice together and share it as part of this study. So I just thought it might be way worth just alerting people to that while we're discussing it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mike. And if people haven't um, checked out the uh, Wales Audit Office good practice exchange materials, then um, they're highly recommended. Any other questions? OK, I'm going to go to Jo and cool. then possibly come back to the rest of you in just a moment. Jo. OK. Um, on that point, just to say that the Academy Wales Continuous Improvement Team are just going through their um, East uh, randomised control trial training. So we are just, we will have a team of people available to come and help you uh, do some of this stuff at different points in time. Also, I know Public Health Wales have already got people who are already trained on it. So there are pockets um, of people who have got all Wales uh, support roles, OD support roles, who, who are looking now to try to galvanise some, some significant activity around this. Um, so that's an offer. Um, they're going to kill me for doing that to 300 people at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, but that's that. And my question is, uh, has been, uh, I, I have heard, the, uh, sort of uh, has been brought up before, which is when does um, nudge become nanny? Uh, as, a, as a sort of actually where's the ethical mm. sort of um, aspects around that as I know we've got quite a lot of medics in the room and uh, and I think it's quite an interesting query so I think it this is a really tricky one so um, particularly I mean health is an obvious context um, but also I uh, think quite a lot about kind of finance um, and there are some financial products which if you looked at them from a purely behavioral angle there is no good reason for them to exist. Um, and if you were being kind of super hardline, you'd say we well, should just ban them. And I think you could say that um, for a whole host of other things. One of the things, so we always do as far as possible, is kind of see what the public acceptability of things is. So like the smoking ban, before that came in, loads of people said, oh, it'll be terrible, blah, blah, blah. And actually, the evidence I've seen, I mean, my health, uh, people here will know much better than I do. Actually, it's had a, lot, a very positive effect, not only on individuals, but actually on the health of people working in those different um, situations. Now, there are situations where um, we have tried, so one specific example where we tried including a social norm on the initial request for payment for adult social care, and loads of people complained um, because we said nine out of 10 people um, pay their um, adult social care on time. And they just said, oh, gosh, like, I'm paying. How dare you accuse me of not paying? Because this was the first bill, whereas previously we'd always used it on um, reminder letters. And I think the point of testing is that often then you can kind of solicit a public reaction. And part of the reason for testing is so you know what works or perhaps more importantly what doesn't work. But also, actually, it gives you that opportunity to sort of test the public acceptability of different approaches. So um, there's been lots of debate, hasn't there, recently about... Uh, how charities solicit donations, um, which <laughs> you will have more views than I do on. But um, <coughs> that is a good example of actually where things, they often do sort of bubble through and giving people, I think the key thing is to give people the opportunity to sort of provide their views and feedback and making that as easy as possible. And it's also part of going back to the, the questions about kind of co-design when you're thinking about it. It's not just coming along and saying, okay, behavioral insights, right, we know that blah, 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 this is sort of what we're going to do and off we go and do it it's about talking to the people who are either the the sort of service users or the people who deliver the services and using that and sort of having a genuine humility it's not saying we don't know i mean but sort of confidence that we know that these things do work but actually they are quite powerful and as a result you need to be careful with them thank you okay thanks very much Christy. any other questions Okay, could I ask you to show your appreciation again?